Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. So today I have with me Michelle Mays, and I am really excited about this conversation. I'm excited for you guys to hear it. When I first read Michelle's bio, I kind of did a really geeky fangirl <laughs> because Michelle is has was trained by Pia Melody in the post-induction therapy model for treating developmental trauma. And if you know anything about my feelings about Pia Melody, they are extreme. (laughs) If you have not read Pia Melody's book, Facing Codependence, get it like today. And then also Michelle's book um, as well. So she is a licensed professional counselor and an expert in treating sexual betrayal and trauma. And she is the author of the new book, The Betrayal Bind, How to Heal When the Person You Love the Most Has Hurt You the Worst. And she is the founder of the Center for Relational Recovery in Northern Virginia outside of D.C. Um, As I said, Michelle has been, was trained by Pia Melody. Her book is phenomenal. You must get it. If you have been betrayed, then this book is 100% for you. This conversation is for you. This conversation is for everybody, whether you've been betrayed or not. It's a really wonderful exploration of all sorts of things. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Michelle Mays. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on and having this just what is going to be (laughs) an amazing conversation. Uh, Well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited for the chat we're going to have. Yeah. So as I was telling you before we hit record, so I'm a huge Pia Melody fan. You are trained by Pia Melody. And so I'm having a little like fangirl by proxy kind of... situation. I'll just fangirl with you for Pia. (laughs) I mean, my God, you know, Mm -hmm. one of the things just that I think is really important is that, so it's the, the post induction therapy model is what Pia teaches. And I feel like so few people are trained in this. And yet it is, I think one of the most powerful therapeutic models out there. Can you just sort of talk a little bit about about what that is. Total sidebar for what we're talking about, but not really. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm happy to. And I will try to represent her model as well as I can. So I think, you know, what she did and did it so brilliantly is that she really understood that everything that we were starting to talk about back during the day when she developed her model, everything we were starting to identify as codependence and talk about as codependence what she really recognizes that that is actually a response to childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. And it is really about what we would call developmental trauma, which is trauma that happens when we're developing throughout childhood. And so she took that understanding and really looked at what are the core issues, core areas that are impacted for us when we experience childhood trauma. And then when those core areas are impacted, what are the behavioral patterns that we tend to manifest in some way in our lives as we cope with it? So the entire model spells that out in gorgeous detail, helps, you know, train therapists on how to work with clients in that model. And she really broke amazing ground there. And I've been using that with my clients for, I don't know, I don't know, 15 
18 years now and so, uh, will continue because it's so effective and so, so beautifully articulated clients, by her. It is. Your clients are so lucky. And I know that, you know, it's not the most widely known model, therapeutic model, but I think in my experience and my understanding of it, um, having gone through a little bit of it at the Meadows, I think it's one of the most effective if you guys are looking, if anyone's looking for a therapist, really post-induction therapy is a really important model to be looking for and searching for. And I think that, yeah, is there a list? Is there like a... I was just going to say there is a um, list server searchable mm. group uh, of folks that have been trained and I can get you that from show notes later. And that's that's you have, yeah, I would I'm happy that. to do that. Yep. Thank you. I think that's amazing. Okay. So we're going to sort of shift gears somewhat, yeah. but you have a, you have written a book. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just did too. It's like, I know I was just like, <laughs> it's going to be coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, about the book, what it's about, what it's called. Absolutely. So the book is called the material bind, how mm-hmm. to heal when the person you love the most has hurt you the worst. And so It is dealing with the topic of infidelity and cheating, so sexual betrayal, adult sexual betrayal. And it's really written for the betrayed partner. So it's really written to help the person who has experienced betrayal understand what has happened to them. And in in particular, I'm looking at that through the lens of our attachment systems and how our attachment systems, how we connect and bond to others, impact what happens to us when we experience this enormous injury that happens because of sexual betrayal. So the book kind of walks through all that and looks at it from a whole bunch of different perspectives. Yeah. It's funny in reading um, the synopsis, which was a very uh, robust synopsis, (laughs) like you break down each chapter really. I mean, it's great. And in reading that, I... I almost, I was struck by wanting the betrayer to also read it. Like, right? Like, I feel like if we're going to go through a therapeutic healing process, if you're going to, if the person who betrayed me is actually going, wants to do the work and wants to understand how this impacted me, please read this book. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Like that's sort of, that was my thought. <laughs> and I have a ton of clients whose partners, the cheating partner mm-hmm. has read the book. Yeah. Good. I've got, I've got emails it. from them. I've got a whole host of cheating partners that subscribe to my blog and read all that. They're in it to understand it and to understand their partner's experience. If they're trying to repair the relationship, they really have to understand what's happened. That's right. That's um, right. With well, the harm that's been created and it helps them navigate what's happening too, mm-hmm. because it's as confusing for the cheating partner as it is for the betrayed partner in many ways. Is it though? <laughs> I do think <laughs> if we take the secret keeping off the table, then I think everything that follows from there is confusing for them too. No, I, I mean, I, I would say that facetiously because I do, I do. I mean, listen, I, you know, mm-hmm. I know many a sex addict and mm-hmm. love addict and, you know, and it is, it's like, once you get under it and again, like if you're, if you're going through sex or love addiction recovery, you know, or, you know, someone who is, or is looking to recover the Meadows has, I think probably the best program in, mm-hmm. I would say the world as far as I know. And because it really does like, you know, the layers that you uncover and the depths of the trauma that it's based in is it incredibly intense. Like I said, I said that facetiously, but I do understand that it's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity at play Yeah, there. in your book. You have a new attachment based model. I think this is really fascinating. You have a new attachment based model for understanding the impacts of cheating in relationships. So when we factor in our attachment systems, how does that change our understanding of what's happening in relationships um, with cheating or toxic relationships, right? Yeah. Like, yes. So, you know, where I want to kind of start answering that question is just to acknowledge that we're in a mind-based culture, you know, we're all up in our heads, we're thinking all the time, and we often forget that we're living in a body 
<laughs> and that we are embodied creatures and our bodies are dictating much of what we are experiencing. And so when we start to factor in our attachment system, we're actually factoring in our bodies more. Yeah. Because what happens when we experience betrayal is that our entire body goes into a profound state of distress because our primary bond has been now damaged and often destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so for us as adults, our primary attachment figure is our romantic partner. Mm -hmm. They're the person that we want to be around and that we run to when we are stressed or we need comfort. They're the person that they're kind of our launching pad to the world, you know, like they, they give us that sense of safety that we launch out into the world from. So our adult partner is our primary attachment figure. Mm -hmm. And when the bond to them, our sense of safe connection to them gets wiped out by betrayal by, and I, you know, I think of sexual betrayal, but we can also think about emotional and financial and all these different forms that betrayal can take within a relationship at the core, what it is doing is it is annihilating this bond and this sense of safety. And often I think we understand that that's what happening, but happening, but we don't understand how does my attachment system function and how does that impact me? And then how do I see that showing up in my behavior and in my trauma symptoms and Mm -hmm. all of that. So that's what I really wanted to look at in the book. And what happens is when our primary attachment figure becomes dangerous because of betrayal, it puts us in a bind. Right. Because they are still our primary attachment figure, even though they're dangerous. Yeah. So that is where the title of the book came from, it kind of spills out right. uh, all the different binds that we look at in the book um, that spring from this attachment attachment bind that is happening. Yeah. And the way that you sort of lay out or map out the attachment injury, right? We're sort of wanting to go towards the, per- like, like we're so deeply devastated and the person that we normally go to for comfort is the person who hurt us. It, it sort of follows the mapping uh, of a trauma bond, but it's yeah. almost like a micro <laughs> trauma bond, right? Like, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it is. So I call this dynamic attachment ambivalence. Mm-hmm. And so the word ambivalence means to feel two opposing things at the exact same time. So normally in life with our romantic partner, our threat response system and our attachment system sync up really well. And we have a, you know, fight with our sister. We want to go tell our partner about it. (laughs) We have a bad day at work. We want to go tell our partner about it. So our attachment system, the way that it functions is that it, it prompts us to reach for connection when we feel stressed Mm -hmm. because connection is the fastest way to regulate ourselves. And our most optimum connection is our partner, you know, when our bond is functioning really well. So what happens with betrayal is that our attachment system and our threat response system, which normally function well together, actually now start to come into conflict because our attachment system, we're now in distress, the biggest distress that we've probably experienced in many ways in our lives. And now our attachment system is saying, hey, sister, you are in distress, reach for your partner. Right. But our threat response system is saying, Hey, you are in danger, run away Mm -hmm. or fight, but somehow you've got to get away from the danger. So now these two systems in our bodies that are in our body are in conflict with one another and they're sending messages at the exact same time that conflict. And so what this looks like for a betrayed partner is that they feel crazy and they feel like they're on this roller coaster because, you know, one minute they're like, I hate you and I never want to see you again. And the next minute they're like in bed making love. <laughs> and <laughs> the next right. minute they're like calling the divorce lawyer. And the next minute they're calling the couples therapist. 
And then, and so on and on and on it goes, right? So this back and forth between I'm trying to come towards you and I need to get away from you. Mm -hmm. And that just unfolds in a minute by minute drama after this discovery of betrayal that is really, really a wild emotional ride for people. It sure is. And then I think that leads into the shame, right? And you Mm -hmm. talk about the shame bind, right? Because we're like, I mean, there's there, I think there's so many sources of the shame, right? Part of it, part of it is obviously like he, he, they, whatever cheated on me, what's wrong with me, but also what's wrong with me that I still want to go towards them. What's wrong with me that I want to divorce them. What's wrong with, right. There's all of the shame. Can you talk a little bit about the shame bind? Let me, before I do the shame bind, let me talk about a minute uh, just about that first piece that you said because I think it's so important uh-huh. that piece where the shame of the of the betrayal comes on to us mm-hmm. as a betrayed partner right and there's this place where immediately especially if it's cheating I am somehow you know not sexy enough I'm not desirable enough I'm too much I'm not enough I'm unworthy in some way, the shame of the other person's uh, choices comes over and attaches to us. And so that's called carried shame. So when you carry the shame, because as the trade partner, you haven't done anything wrong. Right. You didn't engage in these behaviors, right? It's not your shame. And yet the shame from the other person attaches to you. And I always say it's like black tar, like it's so sticky and it's so hard to get rid of, right? Right. But the thing that we have to know about carried shame is that we can't heal carried shame because it doesn't belong to us. We can only give it back. Right. That's how we heal from it is we give it back. So we have to actually figure out how the shame has attached to us and then give it back to the cheating partner. So that kind of shame is one thing. Yeah. And it's a big piece of work for betrayed partners to deal with it. I think it's a big piece of work for anyone to deal with, right? Because yeah. carried shame is a part of our codependence. It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's the it's the trauma. You know, we carry the shame of our parents from childhood, right? And so that it, it is the process of giving that back. I mean, it's certainly one of the most powerful pieces of work that I did <laughs> at the Meadows because, and I want to sort of like talk more about that. It's like, so what happens with carried shame is that the person who, to whom the shame belongs, and in this case, the cheating partner, right? They can't be with their own shame. And so they project it outward onto you and we absorb it and we take it on, mm-hmm. right? So I just wanted to sort of like, uh, like I guess- Yeah, connect the dot there. Connect the yeah. dot that like, how how do we take it? What does it mean we take on someone else's shame? What? what yeah, what, well, right? they aren't they aren't connected to their own shame because they're actually behaving in a shameless manner. Right, right. You, to use Pia's language, that's yeah. the language Pia would use, right? Yeah. They're actually behaving in a shameless manner. So they aren't connected to their own value system. And they aren't feeling their own guilt and remorse that would keep them within their boundaries. Our guilt helps us stay within our value system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so because they're operating in a shameless way, their shame often comes on to the person that is being perpetrated against. Right. So whether whether you're a child and your parent is behaving in an appropriate way and the shame comes on to you, or whether you are in a romantic relationship and it's cheating or it's financial abuse or it's toxic emotional stuff, Whenever a person is behaving in a shameless way, unless you have dynamo emotional boundaries, it's going to really easily come over and attach to you. Right. And so how do we heal that? How do like we you like you said, you can't heal carried shame. You have to give it back. What does that mm-hmm. what does that look like for people? So we have an exercise in our coaching program uh, for betrayed partners that we have everybody do where what we have them do is really identify the beliefs that the carried shame has created about themselves. Because the biggest way that shame attaches to you it is it impacts how you, what you believe about you, mm-hmm. what you believe about your worthiness, what you believe about who you are in the world, your value, your lovability, whether you matter 
all of those core, core, core emotional needs that we have, that's where shame goes. That's what shame attacks, attacks. And so we have them do an exercise where they really lay out, here's the beliefs that I have adopted yeah. about myself as a result of shame attaching to me. Mm-hmm. And then we have them give all of that back. So they write a letter giving back the beliefs and releasing the beliefs. And then uh, we also have them do work on what are the new beliefs that they actually want to be mm-hmm. claiming as their own mm. uh, so that they can really stand in something different that is opposite of the shame. Yeah. So I think that kind of work, I know you probably did it with a with chair work at the Meadows. I did it with the tissues at the mouth. Oh, yes. And that I was, t- oh yeah. my God, that was, I mean, it's so, I mean, it's so bizarre. It's, it's, it, you mm-hmm. know, it sounds so weird, but it was so incredibly powerful. We did do chair work as well, but the t- yeah. tissues was, so can you, can you describe the tissues and the chair work for? Oh, I think if you did it the way I know how to do it, yeah. right. The tissues are, you are literally throwing <laughs> tissues. So you can't really, if you ever try to yeah. throw a tissue, give it a try, you guys. Uh, <laughs> it, doesn't go far. it doesn't go far. Right. So you can just whip those things as hard as you can. And it doesn't go very far, but you can whip a tissue for every piece of shame you're giving back. Right. And there's something about that bodily based oh God, energy releasing yes. from you. That is really amazing. It really is. And so what you're doing is you're actually holding the tissue box at your mm-hmm. heart and then you're ripping each tissue out away from yourself and throwing it at the, you know, imaginary person, like take, take yeah. your shame. This is not mine. Like my self-esteem, my body image, right? Like all of it. And it's really, it's really wonderful. It's really wonderful. It's really, it's really power. It's a really fun thing to do. We do this also at our, we have a intensive that we do where we work on the sexual injury and we have people do it with sexual shame Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there, but we also do have them bring the imaginary partner into the room. Yeah. And that to me is always one of the funnest parts of this because you see, you wouldn't think that it works in the way that it does, but it's like the person's there. Sure. Right. And then you see them lose their voice. They lose their posture. They lose their, and so then the work on standing straight, speaking from your grounded self, using your voice to give back the shame. All of that is such an amazing part of the work as well yeah. of really reclaiming your sense of self in the face of what, what has happened. Absolutely. You know, and so this is, I think a good time perhaps to mm-hmm think about like, if you're healing this, right, there is work now that is the, you talk about this in your book that there, the mistake that we make is like, I don't have the problem. You have the problem. You're the cheater. You're the sex addict. You're whatever. So you need to go to therapy and figure your shit out. Mm -hmm. Ignoring the fact that we are now a trauma victim. Yes. And that we actually have to address our own trauma. And that like, and this is why it's so important, right? The carried shame, the set, like all of that has been put onto us. It's not ours, but we've absorbed it. Mm-hmm. And so it's so important to not skip over our own healing in this. Yes. And I think the other thing I think I see partners do is think, well, because I'm leaving the relationship, I must not need to. Right. I'll just, that's how I solve this, you know, but the reality is if you've been living with somebody where there has been ongoing betrayal, I mean, I work with people where it runs the gamut from a year to 30 years, you know, of betrayal that they've been experiencing. But no matter what period of time that is, betrayal is always accompanied by lying. Right. And it's always accompanied by gaslighting and reality manipulation of some sort. Mm -hmm. And Because it's hidden, the dynamics in the relationship, the sexual dynamics are hidden, but you're still living in them. And so even though you don't know it, it's impacting you and it's actually altering your behavior very subtly, very slowly, you know, you are changing in response to this thing in the relationship that you don't even know is there. Yes. 
and that was a hundred percent my experience. You know, this is why so many women, I think, or one of the pieces when we get out of our marriages and we feel like a, you know, a quote shell of our, our former selves, yeah. right? Yes. Because the gaslighting, the manipulation, the lying, I didn't find out about the infidelity until years after my divorce. Oh, wow. There was a significant amount of willful denial <laughs> happening because there was a lot of information, <laughs> but I just... Okay, well, we can talk about what that's called. But yeah. Oh, yes, please. Right. Yeah. Like I, right. The blindness, right. Like I yeah. just, I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to know about it, but yet I was carrying all of it, all of it. Carrying it and adjusting to it. Oh, uh-huh. absolutely. Absolutely. And so even though you don't realize it, you're adjusting to it. You're accepting things that you didn't realize you're accepting. You're lowering your bar of what you expect in the relationship. You're dealing, most people have what's called um, free floating anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it's a sense that something is wrong, but they don't know what it is. They can't put their finger on it, but that creates anxiety. And now you're adapting to that. And so really taking the time and spending the energy, the time, the money, the, all the things on, I have to heal from this. Yes. That I get to reclaim myself and really rebuild this relationship with myself so that I know who I am again. Mm -hmm. And I have trust with myself again, because we often lose our trust in ourselves in this process Mm -hmm. very profoundly. So I have to do all of that in order for me to go out into the rest of my life and live my life in the best way I can and have a life of joy and, you know, flourishing. And I will tell you that from personal experience, it doesn't, it doesn't go away over time if you don't address it. And, you know, what happened for me was that I didn't really know about it. I start about two years post-divorce. I started to see some things and go, huh, (laughs) maybe, oh, you know what? I think that definitely happened, Mm. but then I still was not aware of the uh, magnitude of it, but I just sort of went, I was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm out. I'm good. A couple things happened. First is that my drinking increased over time, Mm. over like, you know, 10 years. Yeah. And then I finally got sober and I was, and then I was left with all of it. And then about a, I think, mm, gosh, it was maybe six months later or so, or maybe, no, maybe this was another year or so later. It doesn't matter. Something happened where the pattern was repeating on his side in another relationship. And I suddenly saw all of it and I, Mm. and I was suddenly made aware of everything And that's when I went to the Meadows because I was, and it was a good 12, 13 years post-divorce and it was all still there, all of it. And I was, and I, and I had this like fracture where I suddenly saw absolutely everything really clearly. And I was given a lot of information. I was in such a trauma response. I was in a freeze state where I couldn't function for like Oh, like weeks. Yeah. And I finally took myself to the meadows because I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not functional. (laughs) Good for you. I mean, good for you. And also uh, I'm glad, I'm so glad you're telling this and sharing this story because I feel like we have people come in that are eight years, nine years out and they're, they're thinking what's wrong with me. Yes. Right. And the answer is nothing is wrong with you. If you did not get the help you needed to really deal with this, and especially from somebody who knows how to help you work it through, you know, right. understands what is actually happening to you and how to help you with it. There's nothing wrong with you. This is what happens when it's left untreated. It's right. still there. It's still inside of you. And now you're just coping with it. It's kind of become your emotional home Yeah, that you're just living in. Right. And so I think it's a great example for people and to normalize anyone who is having that same experience that this is, this is a normal thing. And this is why it's so important for betrayed partners to get the help that they deserve and 
one of the things, one of our goals is to change the way the treatment field understands betrayal, because I think a lot of treatment providers don't realize this is actually a specialized area of treatment. That's right. And you do actually have to know what you're doing. Right. And you do actually have to understand exactly what the injuries are, how it unfolds and what is going on for the person and how you, how you heal them, how you help them heal from it. Yeah. And so I really want the treatment field to get this. So that, cause I think right now people think any old therapist will do. No, no, it's not the case. Nope, it's not the case. I say it all the time. <laughs> I say it all the time. My audience is going to be like, here she goes, a broken record. You have to find a therapist who specializes in what you are going through. And that's, I didn't know that. And I didn't do that. I was in tons of therapy. I was doing 12 step work. I was in, I was like 20 years in al <laughs> Like I'd been doing kind of codependency recovery of one form or another, right? All the things, but I wasn't doing the thing. And it's so important. I think about the money that I spent in therapy with like, well-meaning, wonderful, probably wonderful people, but I would be like, I feel like I have trauma. I feel like I have, like, there's something wrong. And it was like, there's nothing wrong with you. You've just been through a lot of stuff and, you know, and it's like, but okay, but- (laughs) Do you know how to like actually heal that? (laughs) Well, and even just that, like, oh no, you've just been through a lot is sort of this minimization of what actually happens to us when our primary attachment, that is what regulates our entire nervous system, right? We're in a co-regulatory relationship with our partner. We actually function as one physiological unit with them. They regulate our heart rate, our blood pressure, our hormones. So when that goes wrong and that breaks bad, Mm -hmm. it's not a small thing. It's actually a very, very big, significant trauma that affects every system in our body. Betrayed partners have enormous amounts of physical health issues as a result. And so just that is even sort of a minimization of, I think, because divorce is common, yeah, and cheating is common, because they are common, we have lost the fact that it doesn't make it, it doesn't mean that they are not tremendously significant and have enormous ramifications for our mental and emotional and physical health yep. when we go through them. 100%. A hundred percent. Also, even if you don't know it, right? And you talk about this in the book, right? Even if you don't actually know it, it's still impacting you, right? Like there's, because your partner is behaving in ways that are informed by the infidelity, but you don't know that this is happening. So you don't understand, like you're like constantly kind of like chasing something that you don't understand because you don't have the information. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Wait, that's me. I know I have a lot of podcast episodes for you to get through, and it can be really, really overwhelming to try and figure out where to start or to comb through which ones might be uh, appropriate for you, whether you're trying to decide whether to stay or go, or you're already on the other side of the divorce process. Like, how do you know what to listen to? I have solved the problem for you. All you have to do is go to kateanthony.com slash playlist, answer a few short questions, and I will send you a curated list of podcast episodes to best support you as you navigate these tricky waters. I'll also help you identify where you currently stand on this journey and what's ahead with resources to help you move through this process with knowledge and grace. So all you need to do is go to kateanthony.com slash playlist, answer a few short questions, and you will have your curated list of podcast episodes that will support you wherever you are in your journey. And now back to our show. You can sense it. You can sense that something is awry. Mm Mm-hmm. It creates that feeling where you keep coming coming around and checking in with your partner. You know, to right. See, right. I feel like something's off. Are you okay? I feel like something's wrong. Are you all right? The other thing that happens to them for portrayed partners is their body knows. At the level of your body, your body and your threat response system pick up that there is danger in the relationship, yep. even though your mind doesn't know. Right. So even though you don't cognitively know, you're not in cognitive awareness there's cheating, there's betrayal, your body knows that you're in danger. 
And so then you can start to experience more anxiety, more stress. You can see drinking, eating, shopping, uh, whatever escalate because you're just trying to manage this bodily based sense that something is wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see your sexual desire for your partner diminish profoundly. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's very hard to feel desire when you also feel danger in Mm -hmm, your body. mm -hmm. And you can feel like where'd my libido go, but your body is just actually responding to the fact that there's danger present. So this, this thing about you know, we don't consciously know it, but our body does know it. Right. And that is having a huge impact on us. So when we, let's say, find out about this, when we're hit Mm -hmm. with this, um, the trauma, then it's like, what do we do? Do we stay? Do we go? And I think this is like, you know, this is what I do, right? Should I stay or should I go? One of the hardest decisions Mm -hmm. anyone will ever, ever make it's, I mean, it's so hard, <laughs> right? Especially people have kids, right? It's one of the hardest decisions to make. So what do you feel like gets in the way of leaving when we know, and I, I'm thinking of a, a client that I have right now who she knows it. She absolutely knows it. She doesn't have sexual trauma. It's not, not sexual betrayal, but, but a lot of abuse, right? She knows in her intellectually, in her head that the right path is to go, but she can't do it. She's first of all, she's terrified. So, which makes sense. What what do you feel like gets in the way at that point? I think this is such a big topic. You know, yeah, I know. <laughs> we could do a whole episode. It's such on a big it. topic, yeah. right? We could do, yeah, we could we could have a long, long, long conversation about it. So, yep. you know, our cultural story is that it's easy to leave. Right. The story that you see in the movies and in the media and everything is that it's easy to, easy to leave. You get over one attachment by replacing it with another attachment, all that kind of stuff. And I think the reality is we don't have cultural language for how truly difficult and devastating and heartbreaking it is to sever our primary attachment. And so we don't have that language to help us feel supported by the culture at large in this endeavor, right? We just, we don't have that piece. And then along on top of that, we have this enormous uncertainty about what will happen to us. If this is my primary person in the world, this is the person that helps me feel okay in the world. How am I going to function and survive by myself? How am I going to function and survive without them? And for most people, that puts us into a very big amount of fear. Mm-hmm. It puts us into a pretty pretty significant terror. Yeah. For some, I would say fear for some and terror for others. Right. Yep. And depending mostly on your level of childhood trauma, quite frankly. Because mm-hmm. if you've had a pretty good childhood and you've got a lot of resources and resilience inside of you, you're going to be able to navigate through that fear and uncertainty better. And you're going to be able to to kind of take the leap and go out into the process of leaving and severing that attachment and grieving in a, in an easier way, Mm -hmm. easier being relative, right? Yeah. But if you have experienced abandonment or neglect or abuse in your childhood, then the fear of leaving your relationship is going to be enormous. It's going to be really more at the level of terror. And it's going to, because leaving this person makes you brings up all the times that you experienced being left alone as a child, Mm -hmm. not getting needs met as a child, not getting the support you needed, not getting the physical nurturing, whatever it is, it's going to bring all that up. And so it creates this enormous amount of terror for people. And often that is unconscious. They don't, they aren't really connected to how scary it is. Mm -hmm. So I know my clients say things like, well, I just, I can't leave because of the kids or I can't leave because of the, this, or I can't leave because of that. They kind of attach their decisions to other things because they're unconscious about the fact that really what's keeping them is this enormous fear of severing the attachment and going through loss. Yeah. 
they don't want to go through the experience of relational loss that they're going to go through. Yeah. And they feel like if they lose their partner, they're going to lose them. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Themselves. It's this, yes. this sense of by the, by severing this relationship, I, li- I, I'm going into annihilation terror. I will not exist anymore. Right. You know, and that's enormously big fear, enormously big terror. And it will keep people stuck for a really long time. And they cognitively will know I need to leave, Yeah, but they won't be able to leave. The very first thing we have to do is we have to get that terror conscious. Yes. We have to actually get become aware of it mm-hmm. and start to feel it and start to hold it. I hold the fear, you know what the fear is about. And we usually need somebody holding it with us, a trained professional holding it with us and helping us go close to it and make contact with it and start to understand how big it is and how scary it is and what it's really about. And um, that's a process. Yeah. That's a process to do for most people. With a trained I, professional. With a trained <laughs> professional. A trained and I think- Important. I think, one of, yeah, one of the things I would want everybody who's listening anybody who's resonating with this to hear is that this fear is normal when we lose our connection to our primary partner. Anybody is going to feel enormous fear and go through enormous heartbreak. And you're normal. If that, when that feels like a big deal and it feels like it's ripping your world apart and it feels like it's breaking your heart, you are normal. That's right. And that's just how the experience of heartbreak works. Yeah. And if you are feeling the bigger terror, like the bigger terror because of your trauma, that's also normal if you mm-hmm. have childhood mm-hmm. trauma. Right. And there's no shame in that. You need to get the help and support that you need to actually help you work through it. And I think often people will like attach the fear or terror to sort of well, I'm scared that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of, you know, money and how will I be able to afford to live and all of these things that are absolutely important to look at and think about and, and talk about, but they're also the easier things. They're the more logical, intellectual things, right. And sort of, and it makes sense that you would be scared for all of these reasons, but also we have to look underneath those reasons, right. Cause they they're sort of masquerading as the reason, <laughs> right? Exactly. But there's usually the terror underneath, which is a lot harder to access and and not as obvious. They're, they're not. It's not as overt. It's not as obvious at all, and it, it's very it's very personal because it's about you. That terror is about: Am I going to be okay? Right. At the core of my beingness, am I going to still exist and be okay? and have a self and a life that I can be in Yeah. after this, after I, you know, sever this relationship and lose this, go through this loss. And that is, that is a big deal. I remember when I got divorced, when I separated, I remember moving in with these friends of mine and I would wake up in the morning and I literally felt surprised that I was still there. I remember waking up thinking, oh, I'm here. Huh. Because I think I thought that when I left that I was going to like quit existing because I have childhood trauma and all of that that made the terror so big. Right. And so it really is such a big, it's such a big deal yeah. to try to leave when you have that kind of fear and terror that makes you question whether you're going to still be here. Like not just are you going to be okay, but are do you exist? Do you Am exist? I going to even be here? You yeah. know? Do I exist outside of the relationship, right? Which is the childhood trauma, yeah. the codependence that that's all of right? that, all of that. All of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And can I just say one more thing about this is Absolutely. that also I think, I think we have, because we have this cultural idea also that if somebody is abusing you, cheating on you, et cetera, you leave them, mm-hmm. you should leave them. Right. Then we don't have a lot of compassion and understanding about why it's hard for people to leave. Mm-hmm. And this whole fear uh, dynamic and childhood, how childhood trauma co- contributes to that. We, it's very easy for us to look at our coworker, relative, friend and say, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you leaving? Right. 
I would have been out the door by now. I would have been out the door so fast, you know, and all of that without (laughs) really wrecking. Yeah. Right. You never know what you're going to do until you go through it. Right. But we're not really in any kind of acknowledgement of what it is like for people to actually have to go through the loss of their primary attachment figure and their primary relationship and what that entails for people. Yeah. So let's, so let's talk about what it means to stay Mm -hmm. in, in, in just like five minutes. Um, (laughs) Right. Because it, it, it is possible to heal these fractures. Mm -hmm. Um, What does it take? So what I see happen for the couples who are repairing the relationship after um, betrayal, and I see couples who are repairing 30 years of acting out and secrets, and I see couples who are repairing, you know, 12 months of an affair. So I see the whole gamut of couples who are doing the process of going through repair. And what it takes is it really takes both people to be all the way in on the repair. Yes. Of the relationship that, to be fully say that again, committed. Michelle. Say that again. It takes both people being all the way in. So if you are dragging your partner along, that is not a good sign. Right. Um, I always say to my clients, you know, the cheating partner will put you through whatever you will tolerate. So once the cheating comes to light in the relationship, you have to get really clear as the betrayed partner about what you will and will not tolerate and what your expectations are. If you do want to try to save the relationship, what your expectations are about what it looks like for both of you to be all in on the process. Right. And that means getting the help you need, the right kind of help, the right experts on board, investing the time and energy. It's going to feel like a part-time job at first to do the work that is required, but it's the willingness to go through that process together and to not short circuit it in any way. And you talk about in the book, the importance of full, full disclosure. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you talk about it in terms of like having edges, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you don't know, well, can you, I'll let you talk about it because I think it's really, it made it really clear to me in a different, on a different level, the way that you put it. Okay. Okay, great. Well, so there's a difference between discovery and disclosure. Let's just start Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Discovery is when you discover something or your partner starts to trickle out some information to you. That's all discovery and discovery can trickle out and go on and on. Disclosure is a very intentional process. It's hopefully a therapeutically supported process where the cheating partner comes and intentionally discloses the full scope and depth of the cheating. So when did it start? How many partners has has it been with? You know, what are the behaviors that have gone on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For the betrayed partner, the reason why disclosure is so important is that until they know exactly what has happened in the cheating, they cannot contain their experience. So there are no edges to the experience is all they know is they have found out X, Y, and Z. They found out, they found out about this prostitute and they found out about that massage parlor and they found out about these three lies, but what else is there and how long has it been going on? And so there aren't any edges to it and it isn't contained until you get disclosure and that contains your experience for you. Cause it's like, okay, now this is what I am dealing with. And even if it is a horrific amount of things that you're dealing with. Yeah. Having it contained helps you start to put your head around it and bring it into your understanding of your life story and make sense of it. When it's uncontained, you can't make sense of it because mm-hmm. you don't know what else is coming. Mm-hmm. And that's if you're if you're working to heal it, right? You may never yeah. if you don't actually get that level of commitment from your partner, you're not going to be able to heal the relationship. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. And I would also say this, if you are leaving your relationship and you're never going to get disclosure, I I have people ask me this all the time like I'm never going to get disclosure, so how will I heal? 
And my answer to that is you apparently got enough information to know That's right. that this was not a relationship that you could stay in. Mm-hmm. So you got all the disclosure you needed. Right. That's right. To make the right decision for you and the rest you can let go. And it is not going to limit your healing in any way. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause I was sitting here going, wait a minute, do I need to go back and actually get full disclosure (laughs) 15 years later? Like, no, I don't, I don't. (laughs) No, no, you would only, you would just be pulling like pulling the scab off or whatever, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I really would. I'm back to the meadows I go. (laughs) (laughs) There was one more thing that I wanted to ask you about. I know we're sort of bumping up against time here, but I really wanted to ask you about the difference between rebuilding emotional connection and sexual connection. Um, And you talk about this in your book about how we often think that we can't reconnect physically and sexually with our partner um, until we feel completely emotionally safe to Mm -hmm. do so. Um, But yet we like often don't, right? We're not sure. We're scared. And like, if I have sex, am I going to get triggered again? And, but you have some interesting advice on that. Can you share what that is? Yeah. So this is always like a tricky topic because (laughs) I think for some people, even though the betrayal has happened, if they're staying in their relationship, they've been able to continue being sexual with their partner. Then there are another big swath of people who are not able to keep being sexual. And sex really comes off the table because the partner feels so unsafe. Right. And it can come off the table for a short period of time. It can come off the table for a really long period of time. What I see happen for people who take it off the table for a longer period of time, this tends to be really about these folks that take it off and it's like been a year, it's been a year and a half, it's been two years, Mm -hmm. is that they are waiting for there to be enough emotional safety built back into the relationship to feel safe to be sexual again. And they are not wrong. There does have to be enough emotional safety to be able to kind of take that risk again. Mm -hmm. What I see happen for some people, though, is that they keep waiting for emotional safety. They think that at some point there's going to be enough emotional safety that it won't feel risky to re-engage sexually. They're almost waiting for the risk to go away. Right. And they just keep pushing that out and pushing that out and kind of raising the bar on the level of emotional safety in the relationship. And to those betrayed partners, what I think is important to understand is that there's no amount of emotional safety that the cheating partner can rebuild that will eliminate the risk Mm. of connecting sexually or eliminate the process of re-engaging sexually and going through things that you're going to go through. Because when you re-engage sexually, most betrayed partners have to go through a period of time of like working with intrusive thoughts coming into their head or images flashing in or doubts and insecurities surfacing, you know, all of those things are going to have to be worked through in the relationship and postponing it and just kind of saying, well, somehow there's going to be this this magic moment Mm -hmm. where I won't have to deal with that. And I won't, and it won't feel scary and it won't feel risky. That's not true. Right. Is that true? At some point you do have to take the leap. As you say in the book, like actually bring those, like when the images surface, when you have flashes that you actually bring it to your partner in the moment, right? And allow your intimacy to be rebuilt in that way. Yeah. I think the worst thing that partners do when they're in that, they're caught in that moment and they've got, you know, this image of the affair partner, this image of porn or this, whatever is flashing in for them. The worst thing they do is they try to ignore it and just push through the moment. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about that, that is so not helpful is that they're creating another unsafe sexual experience because they're pushing through the sex while they actually feel unsafe in their body and their emotions 
because of this thing flashing in. That's right. So what we want is for people to have conversations outside of the bedroom with your sexual partner about how are we going to handle this when this happens? Because I'm going to need to pause. I need to not push through this moment, Mm -hmm. but I need to let you know it's happening. Yeah. When these flashbacks are coming in, we're going into the past. We're leaving our present moment and going into the past. So I'm going to need help coming back into the present. And your partner can do that with you in different ways. You have to figure out what works for you because it's a little different for every person. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that is your partner rubbing your back and talking to you. Sometimes that's looking in each other's eyes. Sometimes that's grounding yourself by looking around the room. Sometimes that's turning on the lights and changing things up for a few minutes. It just, it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, it helps you come back into the present moment with your partner. And then you can either resume or not resume, whichever is best for you in that moment. Either way, whether you're able to continue being sexual or not, Mm -hmm. you've created safety there. You've worked on it together to recreate some safety and to work on the safety in in the relationship in that moment and the emotional connection. So now you're having a safe sexual experience, even though this thing was flashing in and messing you up and stuff. As you work on it together, it rebuilds safety. It's so gorgeous. I love that. I think we could talk about this all day. I mean, it is such a big topic and I love talking to you about it. Tell everyone where they can find you. Mm -hmm. And do you, I mean, as a therapist, you're state specific, but you said something about a coaching program. So I'm assuming you also work with women all over. Can you just tell us everything about? Yeah. So I have a counseling center outside of um, Washington, DC called the Center for Relational Recovery. So if you're in Northern Virginia, that's where our team is at. And then we have an online coaching program called Braving Hope, Become the Hero of Your Betrayal Story. Also have a ton of free videos and blogs and resources to help you with betrayal at the michellemays.com website. And also on that website, under the resources, we have a free Facebook group Mm. for betrayed partners right? um, where you can get a lot of help and support as well. And information about the coaching programs on there, all the stuff you need is on is on that michellemays.com website. Amazing. Yeah. Michelle, thank you so, so, so much. Your book is available everywhere. Is it available? Yeah, it's it it's is, out, right? It is out there in the world. It's in the wild. So you can order it wherever you get your books. Amazing. And again, it's called The Betrayal Bind. Yes. Get it. Get it, everybody. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.